what is up, everyone? Brandon First, a.k.a. First Report. It is October 15, 2020. It is Thursday, and that means it's time for our Call to Post, the weekly show where we break down, and when I say we, myself and Raider Jim break down the everything that is thoroughbred racing in North America and really the world. And now it is time to bring in my co-host, Raider Jim, the Southern California handicapping legend. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing well. Every day is a good day. Always good to be back and talk a little horse racing with my friend, Brandon First. Uh, we had a good week last week, and I wouldn't call it a lull, but it's a nice take it easy week for horse racing. And the next couple weekends as we lead up into the big weekend in the first weekend in November, the Breeders' Cup weekend. Yeah, and I'm, I'm real excited about that. The fields are going to be set and we are going to have plenty to talk about over the next few weeks. Agreed. You know, it's funny. I was actually looking over the contenders, you know, on the on the Breeders' Cup website and I went through the classic and my jaw is, just, I mean, going through the tis the law, improbable, uh, maximum, oh, all yeah. those, if they all want to go. Oh, and don't forget everyone's favorite, or at least our favorite Philly Swiss skydiver who made us right? plenty of money. And hopefully you as well, if you listen to the Preakness preview a couple weeks ago, um, really every one we've done, we've been giving you winners. And um, if, if you are interested in how you can get these winners Every single um, race day, make sure you follow both of us. You have uh, Raider Jim at Raider Jim 1090 and myself at First Report, F E R S T Report. And all of our content and really everything else that you can find, um, find us on the YouTube channel um, for First Report and, and uh, Ramblin' and Gamblin' Sports. And that Twitter handle will be and gambling so all of that taken care of it is time to go back and look at this past weekend that was kind of the last uh the, the last weekend of the breeders cup qualifiers we it was a, a very very big weekend up at belmont we talked about four specific races at belmont on saturday and pretty much everything that we talked about came to fruition uh where do you want to start us off i mean i think the frisette would be the best place to go because i think that was uh, uh, a situation that was um, highly talked about. That's fine. Absolutely. Absolutely. We can start there. I'm trying to pull up the results right now from Belmont that day. Uh, we, we did have a good day, the champagne stakes. For those of you who aren't familiar, those four stakes races that we talked about for Saturday at last Saturday at Belmont, they were actually the last qualifying races to make it to the Breeders' Cup. This is the last Breeders' Cup Challenge Series races, which they refer to as the you win and you're in races. It's uh, akin, again, it's akin to uh, the conference playoffs in college basketball. It doesn't matter where you're seated. If you go out and you win that race, if you're 99 to one and you win, you have just advanced to the big dance, if you will. You get to go to the Breeders' Cup. So that's what makes these Challenge Cup Series races so important. Exactly. And, and day out of the office, gets their uh, ticket stamp to the juvenile Phillies in uh, at Keeneland in just a couple weeks. Uh, it was a very, very interesting run from that Philly. I don't know exactly what the odds were on that. I do think it was one of the more um, longer priced horses, I believe, um, of at least the four that we talked about. Uh, but day out of the office, a very, very impressive run that really got the day started at Belmont uh, for the big, big uh, grade and win in your in races. Yeah, I believe day out of the office was the uh, the 29 to one. There we go. OK, the yes, 29 to one. That was the one I actually had talked about Twitter on that one at the last minute. Uh, I was reading some late, you know, early morning for us and late for Belmont. But I was looking at some track information and horse information and saw that horse made a remark about it on Twitter, actually changed my ticket around and put that as my third leg of a trifecta and hit. And that, that was a good way to start the day, let me yeah. tell you. But yeah, that, the, the nice thing is, is that horse lived up to all the notes. And that's where I say I put a lot of, uh, I put a lot of credibility and faith into Equibase. Any of you folks out there who are looking for a good, reliable source, racing form, of course, is good. But mine is Equibase because I go, I can search the, the profiles by horse, by jockey, by trainer. It'll give you the past records, the most recent wins. You can look at files and it will show you 
how they ran the race. It, it's just a, a wealth of knowledge. But yeah, that was uh, that was a good race. Yeah, and and it was a wonderful way to start the day. And it's kind of like what you talked about with the conference tournament. This was a twenty-nine to one shot at. I mean, a, a, a an, an eight seed in the Northeastern Conference that was seven and twenty-one in the regular season, and they just right. won their way. They'll be a sixteen seed. They might go off at 99 to one in the uh, juvenile Philly at Keeneland. But I tell you what, there are going to be some people that are going to throw some money at that. And you never know. This is a horse that um, has, has maybe turned a corner. You, you know, this is uh, you beat the best. The confidence starts to get rolling. It's a young horse uh, at the two year old or three year old. I don't quite, I think it's two-year-old level. Um, yes. You know, that there's a lot of uh, a lot of intrigue with those horses because there's not a lot known. Moving on to um, another one of the uh, juvenile races. There were kind of two juvenile races and then two kind of upper class um, uh, Philly and Mare race. And then the big one, which is the Jockey Gold Cup, we'll get to. But the Champagne, the uh, champagne. was the ticket to the TVG juvenile, a uh, juvenile, uh, and that went to Jackie's Warrior. Not a real big surprise, I believe. This was the trifecta. I do believe it went four, five, six with Jackie's Warrior, reinvestment risk, and I don't have the six horses name, but I had it written down. I believe um, it was Midnight Bourbon. Midnight Bourbon, thank you. Yeah, yes, it ran yeah. in the and, and and you're absolutely right. Jackie's warrior started out at three to five, went off, I think, at three to five and had had won three straight. And sometimes you look at that, you're not sure, is they really going to perform the same? I mean, we all I still am thinking about tis the law. You know, tis the law wasn't supposed to lose in my book. Gamine wasn't supposed to lose in my book. But, you know, sometimes it happens. But Jackie's warrior, she ran a fantastic race. Uh, nice horse. Really liked the way she got handled. Uh, reinvestment risk also and midnight burn and, and again it was one of those things the three horses we named and, and we named we picked the horses based on what we read what we study so again being good students and just sharing that information with anybody that's willing to listen to us you can probably make a couple bucks and this is one of those cases and, and there are situations look we gave you jackie's warrior and, and those but Look, unless you're betting a ton of money, three to five is not a profitable line for you. But when you throw in the other two horses uh, and you can hit that trifecta, now not the greatest, biggest uh, trifecta you're ever going to cash, but it is more than, uh, you know, a three to five uh, favorite coming in on a, you know, $5 bet to win. You know, you're going to make maybe 360 on that if you're lucky, right. uh, which is, hey, it's a win and that's fine, but um, profits a little bit more. So uh, that was something that, and, and uh, this is a little different. The Jackie's Warrior, this is a horse uh, that going into the TVG Juvenile will be, and I don't know the whole field there, so I don't want to go off too big on a limb. I do expect this horse to definitely be um, uh, at near the top of the tote board. Like I said, I don't quote me on that totally, but right. at three to five um, at Belmont, there's a lot expected of this horse. Um, then we have the Flower Bowl, which was... Um, the ticket to get you into the makers mark Philly and mayor turf. Um, these are uh, Philly and mayor. It's just uh, two different names of female horses, uh, pretty much pre able to be pregnant. And then mayor is able to be pregnant. Anyways, that was the flower bowl. That ticket was punched by um, civil union. A another horse that we talked about once again, uh, it, it was for the most part shock, but it, there were three, pretty much three or four horses in each race that you had to find that one. Um, and, and in this race, it was, of course, uh, Civil Union. Right. And I thought uh, going into the race, Civil Union was not the favorite. I think it might have gone off at three to one. She might have been three to one around there, but she definitely was not the favorite. And yet, if you read, if you read the history of all the horses, there was no reason that she shouldn't, A, finish in the money and B, had everything, all the tools, all the credentials to win the race, which she ended up doing. Yeah, and, and actually I had Civil Union on one of my tickets. So yeah, great race. Again, no surprises in that race. No. Everybody I, that was supposed to show in the money did, and it was a race to the end. 
That was unfortunate. I did actually, um, full disclosure, I, I, I did like Cambier Park in that one. Yes, Cambier um, Park was the favorite. Yes, the, the favorite. Uh, and it, it just didn't quite get it done. Um, and then also uh, my sister, Nat, that was, this was a race. This one was the, not, and it was, I guess, the toughest, the handicap, because I think it was even Sybil um, uh, Cambier Park only went off at two to one, something like that. There were four, three or four horses in this race, I believe, that were getting a lot of action, if I do remember correctly. But it is and a small Cambier. field. Yeah, very it small. It was a small and field. So, again, uh, we give you the names. We pick our we, we share our picks with you. But to look at a field of six horses and all of them are single digit odds, it's not hard to pick the winners or the ones that are going to finish in the money. But you have to, it depends on how much you can bet and how you spread your money around. Exactly. And, and the key is, and, and I brought up our Twitter, Twitter handles earlier, you, you, you really do need to give us a follow on Twitter because when we do these shows, um, we, we're talking about odds and we're talking about odds 48 hours before um, these odds go finalized. And I've talked about it a ton. These are not like regular sporting odds to where you lock in your odds whenever you bet it in. No, the odds will eventually lock in for everyone um, when that bell rings, period. It does not matter when you put the bet in. doesn't matter what line you got. So a lot of times that's going to kind of um, figure out how we're going to bet is how the odds roll. So it's hard to make you know, a, a ton of big time decisions 48 hours away before you really know what the odds are. So that's why it is so important to follow us on Twitter. We are dropping uh, uh, on race day. We are dropping picks um, ready to go yeah. pretty much. And, and yeah, in reference to that, that first race we talked about where the 29 to one shot came in, that horse was not 29 to one uh, on the morning line. I believe that horse started out at a 15 to one. 18 to one, something like that. And I just kept watching the number. It really surprised me that it kept dropping the way it did uh, when I was reading the notes. And that's why I was like, well, there's, there's a reason that it's got too many good credentials and it just isn't well known or people were just too, too high on the favorite in that race. And so took a gamble on it literally and uh, paid off. So again, morning lines, very, very important at all times. That's a great point. It's almost, you, you know, think of it kind of like a stock market to see where it starts and, you know, half hour or 20 minutes before um, you're getting ready to roll, how all of a sudden it went from five to one to now all of a sudden three to five. What right. happened in those six hours uh, from the morning line to 20 minutes to post? The final race was uh, the biggest one of the day. It was the Jockeys Club and it was the ticket into the Longines Classic, which is the big one. Uh, $6 million in that uh, up for grabs. That's where all the big horses are going. And this was uh, Happy Saber getting the win in the Jockey Club, uh, Jockey Gold Club. Uh, what are your thoughts on Happy Saber going out? And now next up is really one of the big, uh, one of the toughest fields I've seen in a Breeders' Cup Classic in a very, very long time. Yeah, that Breeders' Cup race is going to be, that's worth tuning in for just to see the one race. Happy saver, I will say, uh, and I am I make no apologies or excuses. Happy saver was not the horse I thought was going to win that race. Uh, it was favored. It had good notes. It had good credentials. But as I was reading, uh, there was a there were a few in that field from what I remember, and I did not put Happy Saver as the one that was going to end up in the winner's circle, but ran. A, I did happen to watch it and ran a great, great, great race and uh, won handily. So uh, I think for that horse to advance to that Breeders' Club, Cup Classic, uh, very well deserved, but that's going to be a tough field to compete against. Very yeah, tough um, I, I do. I really, really do think the horse did get, I mean, not lucky. Um, let's call it fortunate that uh, uh, I believe it's Tatius or Tatius really just, uh, you know, whatever reason wasn't there, wasn't fully ready to roll. I really thought that horse was going to uh, at least show up in a much bigger way. Now, if uh, Saver is going to do that in the classic, they're probably going to need about eight horses to do that. Uh, I don't see that happening, right. um, but Hey, what you get a ticket to the dance, you never know, but that is one more horse being thrown into a 
field that I, I kind of alluded to it earlier. I went through the horses and my goodness, it is going to be uh, an incredible race. Uh, and that was how Belmont um, really kind of ended at least the Saturday. Those were the ones that we talked about. Uh, there were a couple others on Sunday that uh, finish out. It's so hard for us to get to the Sunday ones here on this Thursday show because unfortunately the um, workouts and all that stuff isn't out until, you know, usually about two hours after we're finished with this show. So Saturday is kind of our deadline, but it works out for the Breeders' Cup here in a couple weeks because it will run Friday, Saturday, and we will have you covered uh, on in a two-day installment. It will definitely be Thursday um, and then either Friday or Saturday. We will keep you posted on that um we do have one race uh or uh, one race that i do want to talk about coming up this weekend uh won't be a win in your in but it is up at santa anita it is the autumn miss uh it is a mile on the turf and you know going through it this is kind of a return after last week for myself um i guess you could say a, a trip out to the east coast and and, and, and seeing the horses at Belmont and, you know, different jockeys and stuff like that back out back here to Santa Anita, seeing a lot of the same names, um, that, that I've seen. And the five horse in this is pretty much the, the name that I've remembered the most from Del Mar this past year, twice, actually first, the horse's name in Warren Showtime, who had a really, um, not a great summer meet at Del Mar, but ran in the San Clemente and the Del Mar Oaks and ran well in both, um, finished uh, third both times. Those are a grade two and a grade one, both higher classes than this. We will get to classes in a bit uh, or both higher grade. Um, so a drop down for Warren Showtime, another name that I like to remember, that you'll definitely remember if you were followed Del Mar this past season is Flavian Pratt, who had honestly maybe one of the best seasons in Del Mar history broke the records for stakes wins um, and maybe money if I'm not mistaken, but I know it was stakes wins. He obviously him and Umberto Rispoli had, I think 15 more wins than anybody right. else. It was an absolutely incredible run. And he was the leading jockey at Del Mar. So yes. no surprise. He's still continuing to just go ahead and lead the West coast. Yeah. He's been so good. And, um, and all that is really kind of culminating in for a guy who's been around the last few years. And, and I guess, I don't know if he's ever been at this level, but I think a lot of people have expected him to be there. He's always been a pretty elite jockey. Um, one other horse I do want to talk about in here is um, the two horse quiet secretary. Um, this is interesting to me. Now, if you look at the lifetime numbers, they're not, they don't jump out to you. Uh, the horse comes in at 10 to one morning line. Doesn't seem like anything that's going to uh, make you feel crazy about, but I look at the, the last few races, the noticeable jump in performance since this horse has been moved from six furlongs on the dirt to a mile on the turf. Right. The, the speed numbers are, are almost tripled. I use the, I use the racing form and the racing form gave it a 74 and an 81 after putting up a 29 and a 30. I mean, those are huge speed jumps and guess what this race is running at a mile on the turf. Now I'm not going to sit here and say that quiet secretary is going to win this race, but at 10 to one, I, I and the way we've seen some of these, I mean, lately, some of these underdogs are, um, uh, you know, long shots. We've said, well, it might get right. down to five to one. All of a sudden it goes the opposite direction. I don't know about quiet secretary here. I think it's going to get some love. I know it's only made 25,000 and, you know, there's not a huge amount of money um, in this race in terms of what's been won, but quiet secretary was one that really came out and caught my attention. Right. Yeah. I'm looking here and uh, good, good speeds, good equal base speed. Uh, the last time out and came in, I'm showing, I'm showing placed, placed with Vis Victor Espinosa on the back and Flavian Pratt was riding the winner in that race. So uh, there's a reason again, uh, you, you see these names, you see the, the trainers and the jockeys. Uh, I think that horse, like as you're saying, 
definitely an in the money contender and I would take a look at it on a morning ticket for that. And don't be surprised if that moves from 10 to one uh, easily to a seven to a six, something like that. Absolutely. It's, it's very, very interesting just looking over where this horse is ran. I, I'm looking at the odds this horse is ran on. Um, 46, 63, 49, 77, 23. Two races ago, breaking its maiden, it went off at Del Mar, August 28th. I don't know if I remember that. Anyway, broke its maiden at 66 to one. Um, and uh, that was, of course, its first time at on uh, at a mile on the turf. So I, I think it's definitely worth a look. There is another horse, uh, Giddy. Um, did spend its summer at Del Mar as well. Um, raced, uh, you know, in a in the Del Mar Derby. Also raced in the Del Mar Oaks in the San Clemente. Did beat Warren Showtime in the San Clemente. Um, lost to Laura's Light, but finished second to Laura's Light um, and just ahead of Warren Showtime. So Giddy and Warren Showtime, I think, are going to get a lot of the love. Um, the fact that one of they've uh, Warren Showtime has won it looks like two out of the three races they've or at least finished higher in two of the three races. Uh, those two are going to get a lot of love. I I still keep coming back to Quiet Secretary. Definitely a race to keep um, your eye on. There are other um, races on Sunday. Uh, Sunday's actually a, a pretty big. Uh, there, I know there's at least two grade twos at uh, Belmont, I believe, and a couple at Santa Anita. Once yeah, again. Belmont has Belmont on Sunday has two. They have the Hill Prince is a grade two at 150,000. They have the Knickerbocker, which is a grade two at 150,000. Those are both on Sunday. We also have uh, Caneland's got one. The Caneland Stakes also runs on Sunday, and I think that's a $200,000 stakes as well. Perfect. And once again, feel, make sure you follow us on Twitter. We are dropping those picks. Um, you know, we got to make sure that we have all the facts before we do anything, before we put ourselves, hit that record button. Uh, so we make sure that the notes are out before we do anything. So Sunday, uh, you'll have to follow us on Twitter for those picks. But now we're going to take this opportunity to talk about the classes and the grades. And look, it's very similar to, you know, maybe college football, you have the SEC. Well, the SEC and the Sun Belt, there's a big difference. Right. Very similar to while there's a big difference between a grade two and a optional claiming at 20,000. Right. All those little classes and ways to uh, you know get the money out, we're going to break it down a little bit easier here for you. Raider Jim, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, class has started, and, and this is information again. I have some of it in my head, some of it I just researched so I can pass it along to everybody. But we made reference that a horse that comes in at 29 to 1 is that basketball team, college basketball team that didn't do well during the regular season, gets into the conference tournament, wins and they're in. Okay, so really the more you look at horse racing, there is a lot of similarity between the twos. There is a committee, there is the the American Graded Stakes Committee of the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association of North America. So in the United States, there is a committee and they are responsible for looking at graded races, handing out the grades, saying, yes, you qualify and no, you don't. And this is primarily also for stakes races. So what's a stakes race? Breaking that down as simple as possible. Think of that term in the old west, the prospecting days, where Brandon goes out, Jim goes out, and we both find a mine and say, well, I can't afford to buy the whole thing, but I'll put $50 to buy my stake in that mine. And Brandon says, I'll give you $50 for my stake in the mine. And so together we go in and we're taking a claim, we're making a claim or our stake that we have the potential to earn money on that investment. So what horse breeders and horse owners are doing is they are putting up money to enter a race. They are staking their claim in that race. A portion of that stake, that fee, is the entry fee to get into the race, which is going to go down to the purse, which is then a portion of that is going to be distributed to the winners, a portion of each entry fee. Now, there's going to be four different grades of race. There's going to be the listed. There's going to be grade three, 
two, and one, which is the daddy of all when you hit grade one. And what really drives what's a, what's a listed, you have to have a purse of at least $75,000 to be a stakes race. $75,000 is gonna be the lowest purse. It's also going to be a listed stakes. From there, you go to $100,000. That's when you have your grade three stakes races. Grade two is $200,000 up to $299,999. And then when you get to the $300,000 and above, that's when you see the grade one races. That's where you're gonna see the tis the laws. That's where you're gonna see the gamines. And just because a horse runs in a grade two doesn't mean it's necessarily a lesser scale. One, it's not gonna cost the owners as much to get into the race, but also the grades are handed out based on uh, some of that criteria is how often have they run that race? A racetrack has to host the same race at minimum of two years running under the same conditions before the board will even consider allowing it to run as a graded stakes race before they hand that out, give it the blessing and say, go ahead, you can call it this. They can go dormant for one year without losing that graded stakes rating as long as they continue it again. And it can get passed down uh, along the way if some other, if it goes dormant and another group wants to pick it up to sponsor it. So there's a purse requirement, longevity, how long has it been running? There are restrictions. They could restrict it to age. They can restrict them to sex. Uh, drug testing, they will always have post-race uh, government, if you will. And when you say government, what it means, it's an agency of that state where that racing venue is, is responsible for conducting all the post-race tests to make sure that everybody was on the up and up. There, will, there are lists of drugs that are okay, if you will, for horses to be, you know, for their health, safety, and well-being but they have to be on the list. We're actually gonna get into that in a couple of weeks, if not sooner, because that's a topic that was uh, near and dear and covered greatly at great length by uh, myself and Brandon a few weeks back. And we'd like to resurrect that and talk to you about the pros and cons and the nasty side of horse racing, if you will, but staying on what stakes races are, there you are. Has to be $75,000 to be a listed, $100,000, you're going to have a grade three, $200,000, the grade two, 300 and above the grade one, the big races. Now, just because it has a $300,000 purse doesn't mean that you've got a grade one race. You will have venues that will actually put together big purse races because they're trying to attract the big names, the big owners, the big horses, the Bob Bafferts of the world, the Barclay tags of the world. And when they can start getting those caliber of horses to run in this race, that's how they develop their history and their credibility before they go before the board and say, we wanna call this, we would like to get uh, our, our grading, our stakes grading. So that's why sometimes you'll see big purses, but it may not necessarily be called a stakes race. So in the United States alone, there are 99, 98 stakes races hosted from January through the end of the year, 98. Now, 14 of those are races that actually get you right into the Breeders' Cup, that Breeders' Cup Challenge Series that we talked about. And of the 98, 45, 60% of the stakes races are associated with the Breeders' Cup. So that gives you an idea of how important that weekend is coming up uh, on the, Friday, the first Friday and Saturday in November. And that's why it's very important when we cover the Breeders' Stakes Challenge Cup races, that's why it's very important. And the fields that I've looked at in a few of the races already, as Brandon alluded to uh, at the very beginning, it'll knock your socks off if you followed racing at any level this year. You're gonna see from the, from the Kentucky Derby winners to the Kentucky Oaks winners, uh, horses that have battled it out on TV and at the racetracks from Keeneland to Belmont, Saratoga, Del Mar, uh, it's gonna be a fantastic weekend. It is. It is uh, truly the weekend that all the best are there. Um, hopefully, I mean, obviously, um, you know, things happen, but nothing. Um, I haven't heard anything that would stop a lot of it. And like I said, I keep talking about the classic and that is obviously the big one. Obviously, 
you know, the, the grade one of all grade ones, really, if you will, the best of the best. Usually whoever wins that race is going to win horse of the year. Uh, because look, like Raider Jim talked about, if you if you get into this race, you had to win a grade one stakes race. You've already put yourself in that list. Um, and, and for myself, it's, I try and tell people or, or buddies of mine the, the simplest way when they when you go to the race because look when you go and you watch or you go to Del Mar or Santa Anita unless it's a really really big day you're generally only going to get one stakes race and it might not even be graded uh it, it might just be you know like Raider Jim talked about a a race they threw money at hoping that maybe next year or in the coming years it will eventually be graded but there are going to be other ones that are thrown in there. And what I always tell my friends and, and people, if the, the simplest way to figure out the level of competition and how good the horses are um, or expected to be in this race, look at the purse. If you have a purse of $20,000, now look, folks, to you and me, $20,000 is a lot of money. I understand that. But in horse racing, $20,000 is a $5 bill that's been stuck on your shoe that you just, nah, nah, I don't, you know, it's, it's just covered in Corona. I don't need it. I don't right. need that. 20,000. That's the bottom of the, I mean, we're talking about a $6 million Breeders' Cup classic we're talking about a hundred thousand dollar. Um, that's just a grade three. So that just kind of shows you, believe me, money rules all. And another part of it, we talk about first time starters and young horses, stuff like that. Another thing to look at, look how much the horses were either bought for or um, uh, sired for or um, bred for or however you want to fold for. I don't know what the exact term is, but um, how much they paid the stallion fee for that horse to be bred by the stallion, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and if you just look, it's not always going to tell you that. Um, there are a lot of horses that come off, you know, pay $950,000 for them and they turn out to be great. Or you could be Swiss skydiver and be worth, uh, be bought for $35,000, which is pretty much as cheap as you can buy a thoroughbred. And now it's made 1.7 million. It's the best Philly in the world. And um, probably going to go down as one of the greatest Phillies of all time. Uh, right. so it's now all about money, at least in my mind, that's, that's the best way to break down a horse race, at least sure. on the full outset of it, before you dive into the horses in general, look at the money that is the purses uh, uh, bringing in. Cause Bob Baffert isn't sending um, authentic to that $20,000 purse. Right. And then a uh, uh, day out of the office was the horse that was at 29 to one. Is that correct? Yes, that was the another thing that. to look. Yeah, another thing to consider is they they paid good money to get that horse into the race, and then so the owner pays that money to get the horse into this stakes race, and sees it take off at twenty nine to one. But guess what, folks? That horse goes around, crosses the finish line, goes into the winner's circle. So he now caught everybody's attention. Two, if he has another good run like that, or she has another good run like that, and then one again after that, all the post-racing, all the post-racing life, the breeding, as Brandon was just hitting on, the value for that, that's what the owners are seeing. Even if you know that, okay, you know what, I'm going to run this horse in a couple races, but then I really want to buy that horse over there, so I'm going to have to sell this one in order to buy the one I really, really want guess what? The horses are commodities, unfortunately, and the stock goes up, the value goes up. And, and that's another thing that you have to consider. Uh, when we talk about stakes races, and as Brandon said, you know, you get a stakes race here, a stakes race there, the bigger tracks back east, it's not uncommon to see three, four stakes races on a good weekend. They're big racing weekends, and there'll be 150,000, 500,000, another 500,000. To give you an idea of what Breeders' Cup weekend is going to be on the, if you will, the lesser of the two days, if you go to Friday, there's only five races. In those five races, there are there's going to be $7 million in purses spread over those. Two at $2 million, and then the other three have a $1 million purse. Those are going to be all juveniles. They're going to be the younger horses, two-year-olds more than likely, but you're going to see fast, fast, fast good horses. That's going to be a fun day. And we will get into 
how does, okay, we've talked about the Challenge Cup Series, win and you're in. Okay, great, you won and you're in. So how many of the, we'll try to break down some of these races as to how many won a challenge race and then how does the rest of the field end up in, in these races on Breeders' Cup weekend? Definitely, definitely. And, and that's really what it all comes, it is the, the, you know, Super Bowl weekend. It's all builds up to the Breeders' Cup. And as I've uh, been saying pretty much all year, all we have to do is get through the nightmare of the election night or whatever. We get through that. Um, at least we have some great horse racing on the weekend, uh, that first week of November here coming up very, very soon. Ton of money. Uh, going to be, and I think great horse racing. It will be behind closed doors. Um, hopefully next year will not be the case as we've alluded to in past. Uh, we will be there. Myself and Raider Jim will be at Del Mar. That will be a We're guarantee. You can book that one. That is a one to five favorite that you can uh, you count the money on there. Uh, but next week, um, it, it is a bit of a lull. So next week, we will obviously still have uh, some news and notes and stuff like that. But next week, we're going to take a little different direction. And we're going to break down how each of us individually handicap. It's by far the most, um, I guess, asked question. I've been asked by friends and other people when I go to the track how to handicap properly and really it's there are all kinds of answers um there's a lot of wrong answers there's a lot of right answers and we don't even know if we have the right or wrong answers uh, i think we have the right answers and i think you all should too if you've been listening to us but next week um we're kind of gonna dive in a little bit and how myself and raider jim break things down um because we're getting now closer like we said to the breeders cup um, no qualifiers going on. Obviously, last week was the last one. So next week will be all about how the handicapping, um, how we do that, how we handicap, how we get to this situation of um, pulling these horses seemingly out of nowhere. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, we will touch on maybe uh, a little bit on the Breeders' Cup on how the other horses get placed into the field. And then that's it. After that, there are only two open weekends left before we hit Breeders' Cup weekend. And those last two uh, weeks before that, we will touch on some of the favorites in each of the big race, especially that big $6 million classic. We will be hot and heavy on that one. I mean, yes. to, again, that, that's, that race can be an installment of this podcast by itself. Yeah. And it might be a double installment, honestly, because it could, it's incredible to see the talent in that race and, and the storyline, I mean, the, the Swiss skydiver storyline, if Swiss skydiver can go out and do what she did, that would just be absolutely incredible. Uh, but final thoughts there from you, uh, Mr. Martinez. Oh, I think it was been a great, great Breeders' Cup Challenge Series season. Uh, I've enjoyed all those races. It uh, filled up a lot of Saturday afternoons. And what's nice is you can read, I really enjoy some of the pre-race coverage they do on NBC where they tell some of the background stories of the trainers uh, when it was uh, Derby weekend and they gave some coverage to uh, one of the, the, the African-American owner and what was his position? How do you feel about being there when there's all the unrest going on and the community wanting the, the, uh, the Derby to be canceled? There's a lot more to horse racing than meets the eye. And we like to discuss all that too. And we will, again, I talked about uh, during the, the little spiel I gave on stakes races and graded races about uh, drug testing and medications and things like that. When we get into that, uh, I am hoping to have on, I had a brief dialogue with a gentleman uh, who is the communications director for Congressman Paul Tonko out of uh, New York. And they are willing to talk with us at length and in detail about a bill that is getting ready to get passed and it is a bipartisan bill. So this isn't, uh, you know, oh, this Democrat or this Republican. There's actually a bipartisan bill that has been put together over the past few years that will get passed through Congress, hopefully right after the election, that is all for the health, well-being and establishing a more safe environment for the thoroughbred racing community. Those are the other types of things that we like to talk about and we will discuss. 
Amen. Yes. And that is, I, I honestly believe it's one of the biggest uh, misconceptions of horse racing. I think a lot of people think um, uh, the that by whole, a lot of people just mis mistreat these horses and use them and stuff like that. And unfortunately, there are a small amount of people who do that. But I do think by and large, everybody in the thoroughbred racing game, at least at the high level, is um, in it for the right reasons. And my goodness, I mean, some of these horses... Uh, they have incredible lives as they should. They are top notch athletes, as we've talked about many a times. Um, unfortunately, yes, there are situations um, that are absolutely re reprehensible. And we will get to that as well, because that is un that's part of the story where we are a right. horse racing podcast. We're not going to sit here and and uh, be the be the wizard of odds and, and say, pay, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um but there is also a time and place for that. And two or three weeks before the Breeders' Cup is not the time That's for that, unfortunately, it. right now. There will be a time, but not right now. Um, so that is coming. But uh, yeah, another great pod uh, as we get closer to the, the biggest weekend in horse racing uh, and really the biggest weekend for this podcast. So thank you all so much for listening. For Raider Jim, my name is Brandon First aka first report thank you all again so much for listening now go wash your hands and stop hating now go cash those tickets take care everybody. right and don't and and feel free to reach out to me on twitter at raider jim 1090 and i'll be happy to discuss horses take your criticisms or uh, give you a tip if you'd like amen amen uh same here minus the criticisms no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> take care everybody have a great day I'm not the one